Hello and welcome to episode 10 of the Books to Last podcast. Um, you may have noticed we're a little bit longer than usual again this week. The reason for this is because this week we are joined by two guests, um, Kirsten and Tatiana from the Bookish Banter podcast. We had so much fun recording this episode, I really hope you enjoy it. Just as a pre-warning, uh, we do have a few spoilers for uh, a few of the books we discussed this week. None of them are particularly new releases, but uh, proceed with caution if we do mention any books that you were kind of hoping to read, but without any spoilers. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome to Bookslots Podcast. Thanks for joining us, Kirsten, Tatiana. So glad to have you here on the podcast. How are you both doing today? We're great. Thank you for having us. We're very excited to be here. Yeah, doing awesome. Super excited. Yes, very exciting episode. You might have noticed we've got two guests on the podcast. Bit of a change from usual, but we're very, very excited for it. Um, what are you guys reading at the moment? Um, anything good? <laughs> Yeah, so we are actually reading, well, I'm reading Crown of Midnight right now. So I just started the Throne of Glass series by Sarah J. Mass and uh, slightly obsessed already. So very excited to continue reading that. But I'm on the second one, Crown of Midnight right now. And then going to be starting Ninth House soon. So some pretty exciting things uh, in the pipeline as far as reading goes. Yeah, I just finished Legendborn this morning, actually, <laughs> uh, by Tracy Deeran, I think is how you say her last name. Yes. Uh, and then I just started Gilded Wolves. So I'm a couple pages into Gilded Wolves. Oh, uh, Legend Bones, what I've heard so much about. I have Gilded Wolves and it's it's actually moved up my TBR since watch, reading Six of Crows because I've heard they're alike and I kind of want that same vibe. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah Throne of Glass, uh, Crown of Midnight's the second one, is it? Yeah, yeah. that's that's the last one when things are normal everything goes kind of wild from there I I you know when you they have those series that are like seven or eight books and then by the time you get to the last book and you look back at the beginning of the series and you think how did we get from here to here it's one of those yeah um, we've heard a lot about it but neither of us have read the whole thing so it's going to be interesting to like finally finish and get all the references I feel like and make it all the way to the end yeah I so I read all but the last one because um they were all out when I was reading them and then I had to wait for the last one and then as usually happens if I have to wait for the last one I fall out of it and then I have to get back into it so yeah all really awesome sounding books I oh I need to finish um City of Brass which I finally gotten around to reading um I've heard really good things about that one they're all well deserved it's I um I so they sort of it kind of took me a couple of chapters to properly get into it It was interesting all the way through but like I kind of really hit the stride sort of um a few chapters in and then I kind I was just burning through them and then I looked up and I realized I was on like chapter 27 and I had nine percent left and um yeah it's it's really cool I can't wait to read the rest of the series it's gonna be really cool I think I'm excited but anyway awesome books to get started off with um hopefully we're going to be able to discuss a few more um for listeners who don't know who maybe haven't listened to the podcast before uh books last podcast challenges book lovers to pick the only five books they can take with them when cast away forever to an isolated mystery remote location um our guests as usual get to pick their mystery remote location um because we have two guests this week they are more than welcome to be cast away together or they can be cast away separately maybe connected by tin can phones who knows um uh first of all i kirsten where have you chosen to be cast away to oh i was considering this because i do i do enjoy the ocean but i don't I, like you were saying earlier i don't like sand <laughs> like that it gets everywhere and I also am terrified of the ocean so I was like okay we're gonna we're gonna do a nice lake like on a lake in a cabin in the mountains like just kind of remote fun nice little cozy cabin with like a nice lake and some kayaks and some paddle boards and things like that so that's probably that's that's where my my location is going to be 
nice safe lake far away from scary sea creatures i i also hate this i mean okay the sea is pretty to look at it's scary to be in (laughs) exactly (laughs) exactly i have this innate fear of sharks like a i don't know maybe it's because i watched jaws too young i don't know but i terrified of sharks so even the thought of like being a few feet into the water i'm like no i'm just gonna i'm gonna chill on the beach and just read and so, but I also don't like sand. So I'm like, no, a safe lake, preferably with no creature, like sea creatures or any kind of like unknown creatures would be preferable. So not Loch Ness. No, <laughs> nope, it's <laughs> negative. <laughs> almost, that's almost exactly the reason I hate the sea, to be honest as well, because I watched a lot of the kids programs that kind of counted down all of the deadliest creatures in the world. And like most of them live in the sea and it's terrifying and um, they would sort of, I don't know, just show videos. And I remember just thinking, nope, <laughs> never there. I mean, I probably sharks, um, probably the least of it, just giant crabs and squid and oh, bigger than anything has any right to be. But yes, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I am. Yep. I'm right there with you on that one. So we've got a nice safe cabin next to a nice safe lake. Uh, Tatiana, where are you aiming to go? I actually love the ocean. I'm like fascinated with sharks. So we will not be on a desert lake together. I would probably pick somewhere like Washington where it's half lake, half mountain, or like half ocean, half mountains. Something like that would be really nice. A nice cabin adjacent to the ocean, but also some mountains and like a nice forest. Like a nice like like beach hut that also is backed by, you know, other yeah, wildlife. Yeah. yeah. Trees. <laughs> It's quite funny. I uh, So the first guest we had on the podcast basically created their own geography for the purpose of their mystery remote location. So there was beaches, mountains, the sea, and a lake, and a cabin, just all somehow near each other. That sounds like Washington. <laughs> I mean, that. yeah, that's, I can't, I can't say I've ever been lucky enough to go to Washington, but I should definitely check it out if that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> so we have our mystery remote locations uh, connected by uh, some kind of satellite phone, because of course you guys want to be able to discuss the books that you've chosen. Um, <laughs> what? okay, so we may as well just move into our first book to see what, uh, what you'll be starting off with. Uh, whichever one of you wants to go first, by all means, take it away. I'll go first. So in no particular order, (laughs) my first one would be the first book in the Outlander series, Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. So I'll do kind of a, I'll just read the back of the book. That's okay. Um, So the year is 1945. Claire Randall, a former combat nurse, is back from war and reunited with her husband on their second honeymoon. When she walks through the standing stones of an ancient circle that dots the British Isles, suddenly she's a Sassanac or an Outlander. And the Scottish... in Scotland, torn by war and raiding border clans in the year of our Lord, 1743. Hurtled back in time by forces she can't understand, Claire is capsulated in the intrigues of spies and threatened on her life and to shatter her heart. From here, James Fraser, a gallant Scots warrior, shows her that love is absolute and that Claire becomes a woman torn between fidelity and desire. This, I've just recently read the book, but I've seen the show like many, many times. And the book is really similar to the first season. So I don't know if I could live my life without having uh, Jamie Fraser in it. <laughs> Outlander is one I've heard so much. I mean, the, I, my, the TV show and the books, I have so many people in my life who are sort of in love with them. And I, I, I so I think I might want to watch that. I think I'm going to watch the TV show. The reason I've sort of elected TV show of a book is because I know there are a few sort of trigger warnings that I'm not super fond of reading um, in the books, which my friend very kindly informed me of because otherwise I definitely would have stumbled into that book completely blind, which is my go-to. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, that's exactly (laughs) what I did. And I was, I haven't read the second book because I am just like, still reeling because I like read the book and then watched the show or watched the first season and I am I can't I can't I can't like I emotionally cannot and this is like a year ago so (laughs) yeah I watched the show a lot (laughs) yeah that's literally the reason why I have not finished the the Poppy War trilogy yet because I read the first Poppy War trilogy with kind of I didn't look into it's my own fault I didn't look into it enough before going and reading it and whilst it's an amazing book and it's absolutely outstanding I I'm too scared to go into the second one just yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to get my courage back up uh, probably later on this year. It was last year I considered it, but last year was uh, difficult enough without trying to expend additional energy on <laughs> being brave enough to read scary books. So, um, yeah, we went for rom-coms last year. That's what we wanted. <laughs> That's wise. Very wise. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Outlander, I mean, you've said you've seen, so I presume you think the TV show is like quite a good adaption of the books. Yeah, I would say it's pretty similar. The first, I've only read Outlander as far as the books go, but I've seen the series like a couple of times over. I think they did a really good job. There's a few things that are changed in the show. They make one of the main, like the side characters, a little bit more of a villain than he is in the book. But I think that's just for, you know, theatrics and the, all of that kind of stuff but it doesn't make it bad. So I think it's pretty similar. A lot of the same stuff happens. There's a few things that are cut out, but they're not like huge scenes that are, you know, irrelevant or anything like that. There's no big plot holes that they really changed. But like I said, I haven't read the rest of the series. I just know the first book is so good and I, I just love their characters. Well, an excellent and very Scottish start to the list. Um, <laughs> what will you be taking to your cabin then for your first book, Kirsten? Oh, so my first book is not going to be a shock to anyone. I told Tatiana, I was like, any of these books that I choose is not going to, not going to be a surprise to anybody. Um, so um, the first book that I chose was The Hobbit by Tolkien. So I absolutely love The Hobbit. Um, I, I, of, of the Lord of the Rings, of the Middle Earth realm and all of the stories, um, I think, I don't know why, but The Hobbit is just one that it just always stuck with me. Um, Just Bilbo's journey and kind of the progression into The Lord of the Rings and how that plays in. And I just, I love it. I mean, all of the characters, all the dwarves, uh, obviously Gandalf, he's amazing. And so it's just like, I I love it. And there's dragons. I mean, I I love dragons. So um, the fact that Smaug's in there, I, yeah, The Hobbit is kind of one of those that just encompasses pretty much anything I would want in a fantasy in a fantasy story so um yeah I I absolutely love it that's absolutely love it now the show or the movie not so much I was (laughs) I was about to ask (laughs) I was not happy with the movies um mostly because I feel like there was it was not necessary to have three like three hour long movies for that was my that was my (laughs) that was my question because I have read The Hobbit but I for the life of me cannot get my head around how they made a less than 300 page book into nine hours of film I um (laughs) I'm not they got Martin Freeman they were like we're getting as much Martin Freeman as we can get I mean no one is mad about that (laughs) I am not mad about that the only thing I'm like okay we're gonna add characters in that like weren't even in the story or the plot or anything in the book like Legolas is not even there's no romance there's no that's like not a thing and so I think I don't know if they did that because they were like there's probably gonna be some ladies who are watching this so we'll just throw in some like romance and weird this weird love triangle but also like the same cast for the it's like Orlando Bloom still Legolas and that sort of that that's why then isn't it that's that's why I was just gonna say I think it's because they did Lord of the Rings after like before the Hobbit I think that's why they did it because they're like people who loved Lord of the Rings but maybe didn't read the Hobbit are wanting you know the the characters and the cast from the first three movies that's probably why they did it so long I just didn't think it was necessary I think it was I mean they had like they had like a mention of Gimli in there and then like Gimli is mentioned in the book but like obviously he's one of the dwarves sons but like it's kind of funny this like back and forth between like Legolas and like his dad and that's mm-hmm. kind of funny but I don't know I just I being like the Hobbit is my all-time favorite and the fact that like I watched the movies and I was just like I I'm gonna go this sit not in the Hobbit. corner this and is- um rage for a little <laughs> while because I not okay um no I it was okay I mean the first book I think followed pretty closely but after or the first movie I'm sorry and then after going into the second movie it was just like nope and yeah so it's just it's one of those for me I think it was the the romance that was added and then also the fact that they made an entire movie of the battle of the five armies when in the book it's literally like three pages yeah it's like (laughs) and one of those pages is just description like it's yeah like Bilbo's knocked out for most of it like he's not Mm -hmm. even there he's just like 
knocked out against the rock somewhere and like doesn't experience any of it and just like here's you know secondhand who really who died or what happened and so it's just I thought I was like why I mean I get it because the plot line with like the dwarves and like Thorin and all that but also it was just a bit excessive they could have they could have done like two movies and really done it justice but anyways uh, that's my that's my I'll get off my soapbox (laughs) the Hobbit movies I I mean I the Hobbit is the only of the sort of Tolkien um books that I've read um I do I I love it as well and it's an absolute crime that I've not read any of the others but I just (laughs) it's it's a time thing more than a want (laughs) thing but um yeah I really love yeah I really love that book and it's just so it's just so quote worthy and my absolute favorite like all-time favorite gif I call it a gif I don't know if anyone else <laughs> my absolute awesome favorite gif is from the Hobbit film that I have not seen because I've been told not to watch it and it's we're going on an adventure because I'm, I'm going, because it's just amazing um Martin Freeman is just excellent so I mean we've got two sort of heavyweight fantasy classics um to open up both of these lists um what is the second book that you're both taking with you again Whoever wishes to take the floor first. <laughs> and go. Um, so mine I chose was Blue Lily, Lily Blue by Maggie Steffabotter. It's actually the third in a series because you told us we had to bring mm-hmm. a book, not the whole series. And this is my favorite of the series. It is like the, like I said, it's the third installment. I just recently finished it a few months ago and I finished this whole book series. Essentially the premise of it is there's three boys or I guess four boys that um, go to this prep school and they meet this girl who goes to like the regular public high school, but her parents are psychics. She's not psychic. And she's had a curse on her since she was young saying that the boy she kissed, that was her true love was destined to die. Uh, And they don't know if it's because she's going to kill him or, you know, what's going to happen. So she meets these boys, decides she's never going to fall in love and they start to fall in love with her, of course. (laughs) And it's, one of them is kind of on a quest to find this long sleeping Welsh King and it's set in Virginia. So it's got a lot of that mystery of the South and, you know, wooded forests and all that kind of stuff. And they sort of discover on the way that one of them is magical. Another one of them may or may not be dead. There's a lot of spoilers, sorry for the Raven cycle in here. (laughs) Um, And they kind of, they're regular people. So I really like that, that it's a fantasy book, but they're not like magical in any way. And there's just magic in their world. And the third one, it's kind of a, the end of a love triangle. Um, their relationships really develop and it's a really good kind of cliffhanger to the last book. So I like this one a lot. So I chose the third one because a lot happens in the third one. This is not the first time I've talked about the Raven cycle today. <laughs> is and it? Oh. No. And I was, um, I won't say anything because this episode is going to come out before that episode. <laughs> but I have heard that the third book is, um, it is very well loved as well in terms of uh, the Raven cycle sort of series. And I have been fairly well sold on trying the series out for myself because it does sound like a really, really interesting. It's not one that I've ever read just because I don't know. I think I just passed Maggie. Bye. (laughs) I just discovered her as like, as soon as I got on bookstagram in 2020 last year, I'd never heard of it before. And it came out I think in 2012. So it was, I was like in college at the time. It was a little past like my time as well. And so I was like, "Mm, I don't know, but there's a couple of girls who just ran rave about it. And I was like, okay, I have to pick this up, but I love it. It's a, it's a really good YA series and it kind of progresses as it goes out, but it's one of those ones that's not, there's not like a lot of smut. There's a little bit of romance, but it's, it's a good YA series. It's always good to let people know. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I mean, 2012, I think I was probably thoroughly in my twilight phase at that point so I probably was not paying attention to any of the books um I mean all of us were thoroughly in our twilight phase let's let's be honest literally (laughs) all of us were I mean poor Maggie book not getting it so it's just just desserts because (laughs) twilight was hugging the um (laughs) the 2012 psyche (laughs) yeah it was uh it was this one was published I think I just looked as 2014 so yeah I was I was graduated college and this is not what I was reading back then (laughs) oh yeah I so I 
I was kind of thinking yeah, I I read some YA sort of books mainly Stephanie Mayer and probably Harry Potter and Percy Jackson when I was at school and then I like I went for a few years when I had exams and I just kind of only thought about that and then I got back into reading after I got into sort of higher education and then yeah just windy windy path <laughs> through different genres and authors Definitely. and that sort of thing um yeah it's a series that's very well loved and I mean I like I like a three or four book series it feels I mean four especially feels like a nice even amount of story definitely and they're pretty short books they're not very long so you could get them pretty quick that's I also like that yeah they're a nice read Oh yeah, I mean, with I suppose when with Throne of Glass, which you will soon find out, they start off pretty small, and then you end up with like eight hundred pages of book <laughs> that you need to get through for the last one. Um, is so it yeah, a thousand pages. Oh, I think it is. Oh yeah, yeah, that's why I haven't picked it up. It's because it's like nine hundred and sixty something pages. It's that's the reason why I haven't picked that last book up. Um, I remember now. Uh, yeah, but four books is a nice one because it kind of keeps them at a point where they can be a reasonable length. Like um, the first four Harry Potter books are reasonable lengths. It's when you get after that that they get a bit long. Very lengthy. <laughs> I think that's why like I <laughs> talked to and I had this conversation a while ago. I've only read like the first three or four and she's like you're what and she like freaked out but I was like at the point they were getting like that's when they started getting like really long and I was just like my attention span was not in it like I was just like nope I have I have other things going on and I just like I don't know if I just lost interest or whatever but um I have them I just haven't I haven't read I need to reread them shameful I know (laughs) the longest The longest one is Order of the Phoenix, and that's just because it has to, like, encompass all of Harry's angst. Um, It has to be that long just to really cover all of those bases. But anyway, we're not talking about Harry Potter, (laughs) talking about the Raven Cycle, um, which is a great second addition to your list um, for your cabin in Washington with its diverse and varied <laughs> geography uh Kirsten, what is going to be the second book that joins the hobbit on your list okay so my second book is born of fire by Sherilyn Kenyon if <laughs> anyone is if anyone has listened to Tatiana and I's podcast uh you know that um this is a book that I rage about all the time and love uh Sin, the main character, is my all-time book boyfriend. I love him so much. Um, I will say definite trigger warning for this book. This is the second book in a in the League series by Sherilyn Kenyon. So it's like 12 books and continuing. So there's a lot of books in the series. It's a long series, but um, this is book two in the series, um, mostly just because I absolutely love Sin, who's the main character. Um, major trigger warnings, they're like the paths of these main characters for all the books are very traumatic and um triggering for some people so if you don't you know if you if you don't if you're not down with that definitely don't pick them up um they are romance like sci-fi romance so also if you don't like smut don't pick it up (laughs) but um absolutely love them I love Sherilyn Kenyon I love her writing style she is so great about including characters and building stories for these characters and changing their stories and, and growing their stories throughout. Um, I, I don't know, Sin is, Sin and Shahara are the two main characters, but um, Shahara is this um, awesome, great assassin, or rather a bounty hunter, and she's trying to pick up this assassin, Sin, and um, they, you know, fall in love, and it's this whole story about their, like, them falling in love and all that. I mean, it's so great, and so Sorry, um, I just heard assassin and bounty hunter. I mean, who who wants a princess right? and a bodyguard? Like, no, absolutely. Not. Yeah, she's a bounty hunter, and he's like an assa- a retired assassin. He's like, he's got all these things on his like list of whatnot. But um, there, he's like a tech genius and a doctor and like an assassin and all these things. So he's awesome, and she's awesome too. She like takes care of her family, and she's a bounty hunter, and she's like the best at what she does, and. Um, so always love a strong female lead. I'm always for that. Um, and again, Sin is like all time favorite book boyfriend. Like he's funny, he's sarcastic, he's like morally gray (laughs) and, um, I mean, just great. I love it. So very highly recommended. It's so good. So good. 
Well, that's, I mean, 12, yeah, that is, it's one of the long, <laughs> long series, you know, the ones yeah. that just keep going. I mean, I have been telling myself forever that I need to get into Robin Hub, but like, she just keeps on writing books. Yep. <laughs> and, um, yep. It's, yeah, hard to um, keep, well, impossible to keep up if you weren't there to begin yeah. with, but yeah, sounds like- about. Oh, sorry. The, the, I was gonna say the good thing about the series is like you can easily like put it down and pick it back up, and you don't have to like reread everything to be like, okay, where was I? Like she's she's really good about including some of the backstories and some like information from the previous story or um, things like that. So it's they're easy reads, they're quick reads, but um, they're very interesting and fun, and you don't have to like read the entire series if you don't want to um you can kind of go throughout but it's always fun to kind of start at the beginning and go but again second book in the series but absolutely love it if I could I'd take the whole series but um rules are rules <laughs> I I feel compelled to let the listeners know that um if you're interested in hearing more about bookish boyfriends um you guys have an excellent episode (laughs) um on fictional guys that you want to date and I actually I had to send you a message after I listened to that episode because I enjoyed it so much it was so much so much fun um although we have fundamentally different taste in Bridgerton men but (laughs) mine and Kirsten's tastes are so different and that was a funny episode because I was like yeah we're gonna agree on a lot like we're gonna have maybe (laughs) similar ones and then we get there and I was like oh we don't agree on a thing (laughs) not the one (laughs) oh no I just remember I I can't remember which of you um mentioned it was surf uh spoiler alert for anyone who wants to listen but when (laughs) when you just wait just wait it's coming <laughs> yeah when you got to the section with uh British I was like I was like well it's got to be it's obviously got to be the two that I like because obviously who else would you pick <laughs> and I remember just being absolutely blindsided at the point I had to pause it because she, was... <laughs> yeah she told me and I was like who who's that guy <laughs> there's no way it's not like one of those brothers he's not <laughs> ABC or G he yeah. is uh <laughs> not one of those he's one of the love interests so yeah I so I I was shocked also because he's like not one of the characters I especially like from the series because I've read them all and I just like that book in particular there were some parts of it that I was just a bit like I was just like I don't I can't I can't I'm sorry (laughs) um but yeah, no, I personally am a Michael Sterling and Colin Bridgerton fan because <laughs> Colin is a close second. I will say that Colin is definitely a close second. I love, love Colin. So <laughs> I'm with you on that one. But I don't know. Sir Philip is just the awkward nerd and I, <laughs> I love him so much. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Could uh, Just because you... <laughs> because you mentioned it it just reminded me because I um hadn't made my list before then but I felt like I had to write them down because I knew there was people that I was forgetting when I made it so I've been adding to it when they pop into my mind but I was just yeah one something I wanted to bring up <laughs> sorry that's so funny oh honestly I thought it kind of it had been raining like all day when I listened to that episode and I was feeling quite miserable with myself because the weather was just really great so I yeah no I got a really good laugh out of that also I was writing the most boring report so that was also fun to make it interesting but yes anyway so we've done two books apiece moving on to our third choice what are we taking with us so I'm taking Clockwork Princess which is the third installment of the Infernal Devices series by Cassandra Clare I'm I'm hoping that if I read these, that I'll have remembered everything that's happened in the previous books, but these are the best ones in the series. So I just went for the end. Um, If nobody's read this one, it's about a girl named Tessa Gray. She moves to London um, after her aunt dies. And when she gets there, she gets kidnapped and she kind of gets thrown into this world of magic and mystery and shadow hunters. And they're half angels, half human. And they fight evil (laughs) and she has some special skills she didn't know about and she's kind of trying to discover who she is and what she is throughout the whole series there's a really great iconic love triangle uh with two best friends which we always love and my favorite book boyfriend (laughs) this is my favorite series oh yeah will harrendale is yeah 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 he he was he was number one yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) um he just he just is i mean jem is lovely but will um yeah definitely 
also importantly with this love triangle it's a love triangle but there's no jealousy involved which is why a lot of people i've seen it pitched on the internet that were it not set in victorian times it probably would be a polyamorous relationship yeah which yeah. <laughs> basically they've basic they've i've seen it almost everyone i ever see commenting in terms of like oh recommendations for love triangles or i uh, think it's just like this relationship is basically just a poly relationship it just is yeah, yeah. like they all she just... she gets the best of both worlds oh definitely because <laughs> the ending you know yeah. so yeah good for her <laughs> but my... this last book well go ahead yeah my illumicrate editions came <gasps> today oh i saw them i saw them they're so pretty i was like why didn't i get these they're beautiful oh, yeah they came so they came today and they came with this gorgeous um pottery uh book box and then i've also got uh, they're like acrylic little figurines of the three characters and stuff, um, which I've not actually taken out of the packaging yet because they, they're, too, they're too shiny. They're too shiny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, definitely one of my favorite series. Um, I So the third one is amazing and has also yeah. so many amazing parts. One of my absolute favorite scenes, though, is in Clockwork Prince. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm not. I mean, this book's been out for a while. Can I spoil it? It's just yeah. It's like oh, <laughs> just put spoilers in the in the show notes. Yeah, it's just spoilers. But um, the scene in the library mm. when basically Will finds out and and, and um, Tessa has to tell him, and it just like absolutely destroys me every single time because every time I read it, I'm like, no, they were so close. <laughs> I yeah and you're like it's hard because you're rooting for both of them I hate love triangles it's like my least favorite trope and the whole time you're like but I want her to be with oh no you never like yeah it's good yeah I, it's really good have you read so my other favorite one of the series is the ghost of the shadow market like the whole mortal immortal instruments I've and been, all of those so yeah you haven't read those I haven't That's a read good those one. yet <laughs> It follows Jem, side note for anyone who wants to know. It follows Jem, but it starts at the Infernal Vices, goes all the way past the Dark Artifices. So it goes all the way to like 2016 or 2018. Uh... And it's all the way through time. It's through the last hours before she even came out with those books. And it follows him through time all the way to the end. Uh, see, I thought really that good. they were mostly like Kit Herondale stories. So yeah, Ooh. that whole one follows Jem looking for Kit, essentially. Yeah. But it goes from the end of the infernal devices all the way up until way past the end of the dark artifices and it's oh, like a, yeah. a blog for that it's good I have yet to read the last hours um I think I'm gonna wait till just all three of them are out so that I can yeah. read them all back to back Same. um <laughs> because I know I I need to know what happens like after infernal devices but I also know I don't want to wait for the last one um and I don't know I wasn't as big a fan of the dark uh, the Dark Artifices ones. It was Maybe still, I think so. Yeah, the ones, the ones that start with Lady Midnight. Those ones. Um, I so I've read the first two. I've not read the last one because I remember how the second one ended, and the idea of starting the third one makes me sad. And also, it's also a thousand pages long. And um, I, I, I like Cassandra Clare's work. I enjoy reading it. This is not a negative comment, but I've read something. I've read something on the internet that we just felt so it rang so true for me is that she's kind of gotten to this point with a series where she's not writing new installments to a series she's just writing fan fiction or about her own work and um that is very much that which is nothing wrong with that but um yeah that's that's where I'm at with the series yeah. at the moment and I've not just I've just not been able to get back into it but yeah the yeah. infernal devices I probably enjoy them more um than the mortal instrument the rest yeah yeah I have an enduring love for all Herondale men so um <laughs> <laughs> yeah I had a hard time getting through Queen of Darkness I think that's the last one I was a I don't know it was good it was it was a good ending but I there was a couple of things in there I was like oh okay that's interesting yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of characters there's like a lot of mm -hmm. characters to get around and I wish she kind of had less of them because it's hard for me to because I'm kind of emotionally invested in quite a few of them, but I'm also not emotionally invested in a few of them. I still have to find out what happens with them. <laughs> and yeah, I I kind I really do kind of want to know how they resolve the Emma and Julian thing, but like they bring more characters into the last one too. Oh, no, but they don't need more characters. They already yeah, yeah. had like 20. <laughs> she like throws some, she throws some more in there. I mean, you, yeah, it it was a lot, but yeah, it's, oh. it's it's good. It's I like that better than I like this is so 
long a tangent about the Shadowhunter universe, but I like it better than the Mortal Instruments. I would say like yeah. Infernal Devices, Dark Artifices, then the Mortal Instruments, but I like the spinoff ones, like the Bane Chronicles and oh, yeah. Ghost of the Shadow Market and the Tales of the Shadowhunter Academy. I like Tales those. of the Shadowhunter Academy was yeah. a really good series. Although I was, yeah, again, was I was upset, although I did, I think I ended up getting a part oh. of it spoiled because I read like the extra story on the back of one another one and it told me what happened in the last story so I was kind of actually I was emotionally prepared for it except that when you get to it you know when they give people the you know when you can just tell what they're gearing up for (laughs) I was shocked and I was like I wish I just stopped before this happened and given up like I would have been perfectly happy to not know that this happened yeah Yeah, the end of that book was awful (laughs) but yeah they're just the last the last story with the gearing up it kind of just reminded me of when I don't know, in Real Pulse Drag Race, you can tell when someone might be going home beast based on the sob story that they usually broadcast in that particular episode. So, yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah, very long time. But I do like the Shadow Wonder Chronicles. They're a good series. And I, I do, they were what got me back into reading this, probably this time around, because yeah, same. I just kind of binge read the Mortal Instruments completely legally online on my phone. And... <laughs> I did the same thing <laughs> I was like 15 so <laughs> I'm gonna use that at my excuse and also I feel like she's made enough money so yeah <laughs> our library was closed so I like had to <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's just necessary it's, you know you do what you do <laughs> you do what you've got to do also I have bought so many of her special editions she's definitely oh. made her money back off me <laughs> yeah I was <laughs> living abroad when I was reading the infernal device or the dark artifices and I was like there's no way I'm gonna find an English copy of this third one here and I thankfully did, but I started it online because I was like, I'm never going to find this here. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, I think with the bigger final, like final books, uh, like Queen of Darkness, and then again with like the last one of Throne of Glass, I think I'm going to have to just get them on Kindle because I tend to be able to fool my brain into thinking it's not as long a book as I think it is um, <laughs> in Kindle because it actually tells me how long it's going to take me to read it as opposed to how much there is left. Um, but yeah. Clockwork Princess, uh, final installment of the Infernal Devices series, will be the third one on your list. Uh, Kirsten, what will be the third book making it onto your list? So this is hilarious because <laughs> it's just a film I love. Um, <laughs> we were just talking about this, but anyways, I love Sir Philip. Let's just throw that out there. Love him. Colin is a close second, but uh, mostly because Colin loves food, and I also love food, so we're we're always here for that. Um, I don't know. I love Sir Philip. I love Eloise. She's my favorite of the Bridgerton kids. Um, she's my favorite one. Um, she's just snarky and awesome and very independent. Honestly, her story is so different than anyone. Else. Not that all of them are the same, but hers is just mm. such a different path than yeah. any of the other ones. Um, her kind of love story is so different than the other ones. Um, and so I really enjoyed that. I really liked her story. I just love Sir Philip. He's just like a big, quiet, introverted nerd who just wants to like hang out with his plants and like be a good dad, but he's kind of scared. He's, so, he's you know, he's got the tragic. Him. <laughs> yeah, he's got the tragic. Yeah, he is. Oh my gosh. I I'm here for that. I'm so here for that. Um no, he um I don't know. I just, I love him. I think he's just kind of awkward and and kind of funny. And when he says things, it's very like with a purpose and he just puts up with Eloise and knows how to handle her. And, um, I think he's like the perfect fit for Eloise. And so, um, I, I love this one. This is my favorite of the entire Bridgerton series. So, um, yeah, this one was pretty great. I love this one. This one was my favorite. So to Sir Philip with love by Julia Quinn, it's part of the Bridgerton series. If anyone has heard of it, I don't know, but <laughs> honestly, <laughs> it's, <great. laughs> it's it's such a little known series with absolutely no coverage and definitely oh, no one, um, no not a Netflix original. <laughs> it's so funny <laughs> because I had a couple of friends like before uh, when like the series came out because I heard the series was coming out and I was like freaking out. I asked Tatiana, I was like, it's going to be a show. I was like having a panic attack. Like I was, I was ready and I was so excited and everyone was like, I don't know why you're so excited for this. Like, I don't get it. And then it was funny because I went to dinner with one of my friends, like when I was home over like Christmas time over the holidays. And she's like, have you watched Bridgerton? She's like, it's so good. And I was just like, yeah, I, yes, I have. I've read all of the books. I am obsessed with Bridgerton, the prequels, like give me 
everything in the Bridgerton world and I will be happy. And so she's like, oh, it's a book. And I was just like, yup, it is. It is a great series and you should read it because um, I I love Bridgerton so much. So there's my, yeah, there's my, <laughs> my spiel on Bridgerton. <laughs> I have so uh so I have like a track record of loving things and then sharing them with people and people not caring and then they become mainstream and then to use that phrase and then (laughs) um people tell me about them and it's really irritating and like my earliest memory of this is like in high school I was quite into um I was like into the Marvel movies and like comic books and stuff before they got like really really big to the point where like there was a lot of girls in my year who um didn't care and thought that superheroes were lame and then basically you know a few years later were wearing superman and batman t-shirts like they knew what that meant and then (laughs) um and then with bridgerton more recently i so i hadn't read the bridgerton series because it's uh, not one that I'd come across, but like Regency era romance and like Jane Austen, I absolutely love them. And it's one of those things that like, you know, people just tilt their head and they're like, but why do you like that? That sounds so boring. And it's like, you don't understand. (laughs) Oh, I love it so much. Like historical romance is my all time favorite. Like I love like, like fantasy romance as well, but like historical romance, like Julie Garwood, if you've ever read any of her books, are also really good, like so good. And so, and Tatiana's sitting here like, um, Big Sky Wedding. Like, <laughs> she's like, nope. I lead a lot of Western romance, but historic, I enjoy historical romance, but I, Jane Austen, I despise Pride and Prejudice, like, ate it. So oh my God. I hate it so much. I was shook at when she told me that. I was like, wait, what? Like, I can't. Was, is, that, is that not like a friendship deal breaker? I don't understand. <laughs> Hey, if Harry she, Potter didn't tear us apart, I think yeah, we'd be yeah. okay with Brian and Prejudice. Oh, no, I, that just means you haven't found the right Jane Austen novel. Yep, yep. That might be I it. I don't, I don't know. I can't get into it. I, I've read it so many times, and I've read, like, adaptations of it, too. Mm. And I'm like, this is fine. It's okay. But I don't know how this is, like, a classic. I have a shelf dedicated to Austen retellings. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Oh, so, okay, so there's an author, side tangent, there's an author called Sonali Dev who does, uh, like, Bollywood-style Indian-American um, retellings of just Jane Austen novels. So the first one is Pride, Prejudice, and Other Flavors, and then the second one is Recipe for Persuasion, which is really good. Persuasion is a good Jane Austen novel. Emma is one that people who don't like Jane Austen tend to like Emma. Um, Emma is also what Clueless is based off, which I found out not that long ago, but it blew my mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, I so Bridgerton, I recently so I recently read all the series but the first one. <laughs> and the reason I didn't want to read the first one was because uh, essentially I'd been looking into the TV show because I'd heard so much about it, but I knew it was a book series because my sister-in-law had told me that it was a book series. And I was like, oh, I might read it. But then something came up on my like news feed about potential trigger warnings and like problematic content within the first book. And the, and I read a blog post that very, very straightforwardly said, if you just skip the first one and read the rest, you won't have any problems like that. And that is a patented lie. <laughs> like that, that was not true whatsoever. But to be fair, it's not they weren't unmanageable enough that thing it's and it's not in every single book but every time it did sort of pop up I was kind of like I was lied to (laughs) yeah it's there's there there are issues I mean there are things that happen that you're like oh okay like yeah some of the things that she does you're like girl not okay maybe you should (laughs) have taken a different route than that like communication maybe is don't, key <laughs> maybe don't do that um it's really funny because I actually so I was so excited for the show um and my sister wanted to watch it but she wanted to read the book first and so we were like I was like okay we'll read the book so she read the book and we waited a little while because she was like reading the book and everything and so she read the book and then we watched it together and it was really funny because she's like that's different. That's different. But I liked the differences, some of the like nuances and differences. I did not like that they revealed who Lady Whistledown was the first season that I didn't like, because you don't find out until 
the fourth book. Yeah, you who find out till the book um, mm-hmm. <laughs> where it's yeah. like relevant. I so I was actually so proud of myself for guessing who it was. Like, I'm so glad I didn't watch the TV show and have it sort of spoiled because, like, I I think it was like so I read the, so I started from the second book I think of the second book as the first book so I started from the Viscount Who Loved Me and I think I think I guessed it in that book because I just got this like feeling from like one interaction and I was like I'm yeah my you eye can, on there's you. hints that you can figure out you're like yeah. oh yeah that when they when they tell you you're like oh that makes sense like yeah but she does a really good job of kind of dropping some hints and dropping some kind of like breadcrumbs not only for her but (laughs) other people too so you're kind of like who is it but I really I really enjoyed the book series um I know a lot of people are really upset that Roger Jean Page is not in the second series the second the second season he's barely in it after that book it's not (laughs) his season like his season is his book is the first book his season is the first season and the second season is solely about Anthony and Kate and so I am so excited that one's really good too that was that has to be uh, yeah that's my second favorite that one's really good so I love Kate she's great also she has a corgi and I um relate with that a lot so I love that but um yeah it's I I just love the series as a whole but I would say just Sir Philip with Love is my favorite just because it's so different Philip is so different from literally all the other men in the series like he's just like I said he's just he's kind of a large nerd who's <laughs> just soft-spoken and just everything that I would love in a man so I love him so much funnily enough he actually so as a character there is a gentleman who works um in the same company as me who I won't name here but uh very much gives me the gentle giant soft-spoken but could also probably cause you serious injury if they need because I happen to know this individual is a like trained in martial arts but you would never know it to look at them um it's really so it's very much that vibe um but yeah so Philip with love was it's I think the reason it feels so different is because it's I think it's like the one of the main only ones where the majority of the story doesn't really take place in London with all of the parties the and that and the sort of stuff it's a different all, yeah it's a very different sort of tone. I mean, my favorite of the series is, I think it was When He Was Wicked, uh, because, yeah, I I have, so between Adversaries to Lovers, which is why I really like um, Anthony and Kay, um, but like kind of the reason why I really like Will Herondale is I just love watching um, ordinarily unfazed men pine after something they can't have. Like, I just think... <laughs> I just think it's excellent and it just it feeds my soul um (laughs) um so yeah we've got Julia Quinn and um and uh, the is is it the is it the fifth one or the I forget the order (laughs) it's the fifth book yes yes it's it's the fifth one so because she's Daphne's first and then goes ABC and then E yeah I just you know the letters (laughs) yeah (laughs) um awesome so moving on to our fourth picks um what is the next book that's going to be joining the list are we on, are we on the fourth well, yeah good. fourth okay. one <laughs> so i am going to pick the invisible life of Addie larue by ve schwab there are very few books that make me cry i just finished this one like two weeks ago and i know that i'm gonna reread this book a thousand times i think um, if you don't know what it's about, it's about a girl named Addie. She makes a deal with the devil, essentially, uh, to live free <laughs> forever. And the trade-off to that is that she will never be remembered. Yeah. And so she lives her whole life up until about 2014. And then she walks into a bookstore and meets a boy who says, I remember you. And it's kind of her tossed through her life and the story of Addie LaRue. And I, like I said, I never cry in books. I was talking to Kirsten about this and she's like, I've heard that's a really emotional book. And I was like, oh, it's not too bad. Like it's pretty sad, but I'm not, I don't really get why people are crying. And then I got like, I don't know, two or three chapters from the end. And I texted Kirsten. And I was like, I'm just silently weeping. Like it's 11 PM at night. Tears are rolling down my face. And I just finished. <laughs> so <laughs> this was one of those books that I had never read the e. Schwab. Like this is my first one that I've read of hers. She has such a really, like, I don't know. She has such a beautiful writing style. I think it's very easy to read. I like the story. There was a few things I would have liked more of, but it was a really great standalone. And it's one of those ones I think you could read over and over again and never get tired of the story. 
Yeah, I so I read that recently because I, like everyone else, saw the hordes of uh, weeping Instagram stories of people unable to console themselves after finishing this book. So I don't cry generally at stories. There are very few moments where that have really gotten me like Same. in tears. I didn't cry at The Invisible Life of Adelie Leroux. And oh. I think the reason for that is because I expected it to be I suppose sadder than it was because yeah. of how many people I'd seen crying over it. Um, I thought it was, I mean, it was a, it was a bit, bittersweet ending and that was like my takeaway. And I don't know, I guess I did really enjoy it. Um, I guess maybe I didn't cry because again, because I've got issues clearly, I kind of prefer. <laughs> I, I am kind the same. Of, I never I cry. I prefer the bad guy. Um, <laughs> because Definitely. I um, cried so I won't spoil it but I cried in Henry's last point of view chapter yeah. so that part was really I wasn't expecting that level of emotion from him I think and that really took me for a, a loop I was like oh okay all yeah. right I agree I like Luke better yeah see you know what's so funny is you guys are like yeah I don't cry I <laughs> sob when I when I like read stories like I'll read something remotely sad and I'll just be like in the corner rocking myself back and forth like <laughs> this is so terrible and it's so funny because I don't remember there was a book that Tatiana and I both read and I can't remember what it was and she was like yeah it's kind of sad and I was just like not okay Crooked Kingdom. Like, book was destroyed Kingdom. Crooked Kingdom that's what it was and she yeah. oh, <laughs> I haven't read it yet I haven't read it yet I so I just read Six of Crows and oh I have Crooked Kingdom ready it's yeah. oh, here so and it's ready good. so good and it was it's so funny really she's good. like it's sad if there's like a really sad part she's like you'll oh, probably no. cry and I was like okay like I was expecting like some tears I couldn't see I had to put the book down but I'm a highly emotional person like extremely emotional person so don't take my word for it if you usually don't cry you may not cry like okay yeah. I'm now scared I, because I'm incredibly emotionally invested in these characters I think my emotional investment in the characters themselves plays a big part of it I mean it's yeah very specific books with very specific characters that make make me cry I may get caught out actually if I do read that now because I'm a little bit more emotional <laughs> than usual at the moment that's okay this is a series <laughs> that's a series to be emotionally invested in I think yeah this one's a standalone I just wasn't expecting it and I was just reading that last part I I was very shocked I was not anticipating that level of emotion of coming from his character at all and I was like wow yeah. okay <laughs> I've so I've never read any of her other but that's the first book of uh, the Schwab's that I've read as well but I do I kind of want to try um A Darker Shade of Magic now because I've read it and I did really enjoy it and I like I like the way she writes I mean it didn't take me very long to finish the book which was nice because it does like it's quite it is quite a, a long book really yeah. and I think um it, and it flicks between sort of timelines and that sort of thing and there were parts of it where I was like I was it did upset me at times because like even though I was also of the opinion that she was very lucky um <laughs> and realistically there were some problems that I was like you know it sounds like sad but like the the, the people some people have it worse <laughs> definitely um yeah I there were parts where I did really feel for her and like especially towards the beginning when she's really finding her feet I suppose with everything that's going on um but yeah, it was uh, a book that I read, I want to say last year. I don't think it was this year, but I, yeah. what is time anymore? I don't. Yeah, who knows? Uh, <laughs> I, I always say, I, I don't remember any book I've read prior to when I started Bookstagram. Like, yeah. I don't remember a single thing before that because I didn't write it down or keep knowledge of it. <laughs> so I don't yeah. remember anything. I've been having discussions where I'm like, oh, I read this book last year. And then it's like, oh, no, you actually read that book in 2018. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's kind of, I mean, it's it's June in like three days. I don't, I don't, I don't I know what's even happening. Believe it. I'm, I was just like, I was talking about that. I'm like, I can't believe this year feels like, obviously last year to forever. And this year's, I don't know, time, time does not exist now. Time is irrelevant, mostly because I, like most of us work from home. And so it's like, okay, what are we going to do at home today? <laughs> yeah, that's very much like the weekends don't feel like the same. That's why we've been kind of going out of our way to make plans at the weekends because otherwise it doesn't feel like we had a weekend. <laughs> um, but yes, anyway, The uh, Invisible Life of Addie LaRue is um, 
really awesome trip. Do you have a particular edition that you'd want to take? Because I know I've seen the American edition and it's actually really nice. I think it's nicer than the UK edition. Yeah, I have the, this is the one that I have. Yes, that's the one. I like the one with the foil that's on it. I don't have that. I have one from, it's a company called Book of the Month. I don't know if you guys have that in the UK, but it's. I think you can. I'm not sure. I've heard of it though. It yeah. does look really good. I have. But I want the one with the tree on it. Yeah, I like the your guys' version better, I think. I think, ah, yeah. So this one is the Illumicrate version. And yes, that. <laughs> I, yeah, I like the silver. I did, so, um, yeah, because I've got, I've had more time on my hands than I should. I ended up buying all of the UK editions. I looked at them all side by side. I picked which one I wanted Ooh. and then I sold the ones that I didn't want. Um, at smart. cost, at cost, because I don't believe in bulk buying limited editions special editions just to make lots of money off of yeah. <laughs> no especially when I know I'm gonna sell it if it's one that I love and own for several years and like it's yeah that's different but when I know I'm gonna sell it it tends to be just a now I need to know which one I like best because I don't have enough space to own five copies. copies of the same yeah. book I just I just don't I don't understand I've seen so many like bookstagram just shelves of just it's the exact same book but it's every single version of that book and I have no idea who has that kind of space <laughs> I and or money them. or money <laughs> some of these special editions I'm like how I okay don't get me wrong okay I have we were talking about this Tatiana and I about special editions and this isn't our this or that episode do you like special editions or not yeah. or collector's editions and there are two books that I have collector's editions of The Hobbit because mm-hmm. obviously and The Princess Bride and because I absolutely adore the Princess Bride, yes. but those are the only two that I have like special editions or collectors editions of. I oh, it's so pretty. See, I I could buy Tolkien like special edition books all day, like all of them. I don't I don't care how many copies I have. I would buy all of them. I would have like six shelves. But that's just me for that. But that's like just that specific one. But I see people who have like special editions for everything. They have like ten of the same book. And it's the same copy. Like there are some yeah. people I've seen who have the same copy, which is fine. I mean, if you want to do that, you do you. It's your money. You, you're an adult. You buy what you want to buy. But me personally, I don't understand that. <laughs> yeah. The um, I mean, Cassandra Clare now especially has so all the book boxes do versions of their books. I have ended up just opting for the Waterstones editions because they are my local like bookstore chain. I want to, I want them to continue to exist and that sort of thing. Oh those are really really good copies I so I think I have the smaller copies of the um infernal devices ones with the oh yeah on. that's the yeah um, the other ones but yeah, I had now, the same ones as you Tatiana yeah well now I've got the special editions I think I may end up selling my paperback <laughs> copies because I I do really like I've had to be really harsh with myself about <laughs> how many copies of books that I have because I did I did go to a, a time when I had probably about five or six copies of Pride and Prejudice realistically I just need like my paperback copy (laughs) and then I have like an Eastern Eastern Press one that I like and then I don't really need I don't need that many I don't need (laughs) but um yes totally fair I I do think I'm going to treat myself to an illustrated copy of The Hobbit though because I think like not like graphic novels but illustrated editions of books especially fantasy ones are I have the Harry Potters the big Harry Potter that are illustrated and then the one that yep those (laughs) And then I have, yeah, and the red one that you have. <laughs> yeah, the, the Mina one Lima pops ones. Out. Yeah, so, because yeah. um, Mina Lima, I did not realize this because they do really nice editions of, um, sorry, sorry, listeners, this is special edition corner, um, but like, um, they do special editions of um, a lot of children's books like uh, Peter Pan and Beauty and the Beast. And I've known about those for years, but then I didn't realize until I saw that they'd done Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone um that they actually were the people who made the props for the Harry Potter films so Mina Lima actually I don't know if they made the props but they designed them so like Weasley's Wizard Weezes like the packaging for things that's that's them I think that's so interesting I'm I'm pretty sure I'm feel like I need to fact check myself but I'm fairly certain (laughs) they were involved they were they were involved with like um like Harry like the actual films and that sort of thing which kind of makes complete sense when I look at the way they design things yeah. because it's very it's very in tune with that but um yeah so back to lists sorry about that. I love yeah I love special editions of books um you 
over in America, the Barnes and Noble leather bound editions are just amazing. So good. Yeah, I have the Count of Monte Cristo is my favorite one that I own because I love the Count of Monte Cristo. That is my oh, my favorite books. <laughs> I love the Count of Monte Cristo. I can't believe I left that off of here. I might have to do some changes. Hold on, <laughs> pause. <laughs> Your honorable mention. <laughs> no, yes. that is not an honorable mention. This is a this is a has to go on the list. Hold on, let me find it. Yeah, the Count of Monte Cristo is um my all-time favorite book but we may end up talking about that um afterwards now there she is <laughs> sorry I no like, problem. I'm gonna have to change things around or throw it in as an honorable mention because well, I absolutely love the Count of Monte Cristo it is your turn to share your fourth book on your list fourth book I, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say it's gonna be the Count of Monte Cristo but we'll throw it in as an honorable mention later because We'll talk about it later. Um, but anyways, uh, The Little Paris Bookshop by Nina George. I absolutely mm-hmm. love this book. Speaking of books that made us cry. Um, <laughs> the story for this book is just so, um, it's an emotional roller coaster, honestly. Um, it follows a guy who owns a, what they call a literary apothecary. So it's like a, it's a, it's a bookstore, right? And he basically someone can walk into the store and he'll like prescribe them a book based on you know what he thinks will help them basically and he's like famous for this in Paris and so people will come into his bookshop and he'll like give them certain books that are like okay this is what you need in your life and this is going to help you and so on and so forth and so but he can't do that for himself and so he's kind of stuck in this weird rut that he's been stuck in for the last like 20 30 years because of a love affair gone wrong um, she left him kind of a situation and so he hasn't been able to move on from that and basically the whole book is him moving on from that and actually living his life again um it's very sad um <laughs> there are some um I wouldn't say I would say some trigger warnings in regards to like like people dying uh so like death um but it's not like graphic deaths or anything like that it's just like mention of people dying and like things like that so um but it is it's so good it's I when I read it I honestly I picked it up because I was going through a major Paris phase like a very like I don't know why but I was just like anything that had Paris or in the title or mention of Paris or the Eiffel Tower or anything or any kind of like French inspired anything. I have so many. Um, and so I bought this book just because of that, and I was not expecting to like it as much as I did. And it's probably one of my favorite standalones that I've read. Um, it's so good. And the story is just, it's so heartbreaking, but it's just so good. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I, so the Little Paris bookshop, I have heard of I actually think I owned a copy and then I never ended up reading it and then it ended up somehow making its way out of my shelf in an unhaul or something like that but um I have I yeah I recently watched <laughs> only mildly tangentially <laughs> related to Paris but I recently was uh, uh informed that I had to watch the Moulin Rouge <laughs> and that immediately had me researching books that were set um around about the same time um and when you if you ever search books set in Paris the little Paris bookshop always always comes up and is like really well loved um is it I mean is it purely just contemporary fiction as opposed to like no sort of fantasy magical yeah it's, no it's, it's not a wizard like <laughs> nope it's which is shocking because I usually go for some sort of either sci-fi or fantasy obviously by the picks that I had but or romance um but this one is just contemporary there's some romance in it but it's not that's not the whole premise of the book it's honestly just him figuring out how to actually live his life again um and it's it's just so good and it it, for me I read it at a time where I was kind of I was transitioning in like roles for work and I had just moved to St. Louis and there was a lot of things that were going on in my life that were very like transitionary and kind of like me kind of picking up my life and moving to a new place and starting a new role and just a lot of things that were changing in my life. And so this was a really good book to kind of, I guess, set me on a path of like, okay, you're going to live your life and you're going to enjoy this place that you're moving to and you're going to, you know, experience it and enjoy it. And maybe if it turns out to be bad, okay, that's fine. We can move on, but um, at least give it a shot and enjoy it and live your life and don't let that um, 
affect you. So, and I did, I love, I, I just moved from St. Louis. I absolutely love St. Louis. So I was just, I was moving to St. Louis at the time. So um, highly recommend it. Um, it is pretty emotional. There's a lot of, there's a lot of characters in it and they all play like pretty strong roles within his character arc. Um, and I, they're all, they all have like a vital role. And um, the main character isn't, my favorite he's kind of eh but some of the side characters I absolutely I love I absolutely adore them so um it's a good book I really love it that sounds um really good and it's always good when a book can sort of help you through something that you're like when you're when you're going through something similar to the characters and you're able to sort of travel along that journey with them and when it helps is always really good as well well that is fourth choices done means we're all moving into our fifth and final choices for our lists um Tatiana do you want to finish off your list with your final choice sure no one is surprised by this (laughs) my uh, final choice is Crescent City the House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J Mass (laughs) I I don't I shouldn't say this because the series isn't done yet but I do this is this book is 82% of my personality. I love it so much. I've only read it once. And this is another one. I always say this. I'm like, I never cry. Here's the two books that made me cry ever. Um, so yeah, this book, (laughs) I was like sobbing at the end. It is so well-written. I love that. It's, you know, 800 pages. I love Sarah's world building. I love all of her books. I always say they're like 20%, you know, 20% kind of info dump, 60% slow burn. 20% 20% chaos. Those are all of her books. <laughs> um, and this one is no exception. I love Bryce's character and her relationship with Danica. I was very emotional from the get-go. Um, I didn't read the premise of the book, got about the, I don't know, a hundred pages in or so, was emotionally wrecked by it, had to put it down, <laughs> picked it back up like a week later and devoured the rest of it. And it just like, I remember sobbing and I read it, was reading it like my lunch hour. So I'm at, in the middle of work, like, <laughs> okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. Just trying to recover from everything that was happening. And it was such a good book. I I love it so much. And I just love her writing and the characters are so good. Yeah. It is one, again, that I own and, oh, I'm throwing my pen. Um, It's one (laughs) that I own and one that I need to read. I've seen that they've just announced the name, the the title and sort of kind of the cover of the sequel. Um, Yeah. the reason why I mean that wouldn't have been on my radar purely because I haven't read the book except um a YouTuber I follow um a YouTube channel called Wanderness um she predicted like what the title was going to be and all of that sort of thing um beforehand and I had seen that and then I saw the announcement and I had immediately actually go and tell her (laughs) that she was psychic um (laughs) yeah it um, was everyone kind of freaked out about the title but if you look that's the names of the houses so it wasn't that surprising yeah I was like okay I I saw that coming (laughs) but I mean what did you think it was sort of quite um clear that they would go to their next because I know she likes uh she likes to travel around different I mean my only experience with mass is throne of glass and I mean you talk about slow burns and characters and all that sort of stuff um, every one of her books is like that all of yeah, them are like that I probably I like Rowan a bit too much I, <laughs> <laughs> um so I'm gonna have to yeah I'm gonna have to I think I'm gonna have to get around to because it's her it's like an it's more it's an adult fantasy it's adult, it's yeah not, yeah it's not I mean to be fair Throne of Glass in my opinion was not YA by the yeah, time you got the end of that series <laughs> we were saying that we're like I think we haven't read all the way through, but I think as the series gets on, it gets more and more adult. And I feel the same way. Did you read um, A Court of Silver Flames yet? No. So that okay. is, oh. I I need to read that series. I'm going this to is, read it. Yeah. I Oh, so, oh yeah. Because you said, okay, you haven't yeah. read that guitar at all. <laughs> right. No, every, so everything I, so I've read Throne of Glass, which I realistically, I think if anybody is like familiar with Sarah J. Mass's work, <laughs> it is probably the one that is the most tame in terms yes. of content. Akasif is not. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Yeah, from, I don't actually know what happens in her other series, mm-hmm. but I have probably more knowledge than I should <laughs> about the location and 
general themes of the smut in those books. So this one is it's the only thing people comment on. Yeah, yeah. That's that's all that A Court of Silver Flames is only smut. That's like the whole <laughs> <That's> book. <it. laughs> but this one is pretty mild. I would say it's somewhere in between yeah. Throne of Glass and that. It's adult in she uses a lot of like profanities in this one, yeah. I think. But there are there's a couple of like steamy makeout scenes, but there's no yeah. real smut in this one. So she and, uses actual swear words. She doesn't make up her own like she did for Throne of Glass because they were irritating. <laughs> yeah, they are. It is profound throughout the whole. We're like, okay, so this is an adult novel, just like right off the bat. <laughs> we're gonna swear. <laughs> Great. It's, funny. it's like, have you guys, have either of you seen? That reminds me. Have either of you seen The Good Place? or heard of yes, the good place I've seen some of it. so so they can't curse and it's just like like the f word is fork mm-hmm. and so like everything is like like every time they try to curse it's like a different it's like, word holy shirt. So it's like yeah exactly and it's just like different words every time and that just reminds me of that it's like yeah she makes no, up she, her own words and that's great she goes for it in this one so you're like okay page three this is an adult novel yeah but i don't know if it's and i like it because for me it's like bryce is 25 ish i think somewhere in that range and so this was really nice to read yeah i think there's a lot of new new adult fantasy that they say is new adult but the protagonist is still 18 and it's like mm-hmm. i want someone that's like 28 or you know 25 even so that one was nice and it's urban fantasy which isn't my favorite but it is very shadow hunters feel to it and their friendships are really great it's got werewolves vampires angels demons you know the whole thing mermaids the whole all the things we love yeah Yeah. that sounds I mean it sounds like a I read like an arc a few years ago that was trying to be all those things and didn't do it very well so I'm kind of um, I'm intrigued to go down that sort of route. I'm more inclined towards sort of older protagonists these days because like I turned so I turned 22 this year and I mean I'm kind of at the I'm I well I kind of feel like across the point a few years ago where I don't really sympathize with 16 year old problems anymore because I'm at the point where I just want to tell them to just go home because they're it gets a child. better guys <laughs> chill out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I I used to be very much yeah no they shouldn't be treated like and then now I've I've gotten to the point where I I I don't feel like I'm that far away from when I was that but I also can't imagine what I was like um at that age either so I'm kind of preferring the books that I read that do have like grown-ups like actual grown-ups as, as their main characters yeah that's that was so funny really nice I I always hear whenever you you can always tell when your reading style changes or when you're getting older when you start uh <laughs> you start agreeing with like who is it Triton uh or in uh in the little mermaid when she's like I'm 16 I'm an adult and it's like no honey you're a child <laughs> like let's take a step back maybe we don't marry a man that um we don't know yeah Who's, maybe we don't um, not even your species. like let's just throw that out there like I don't know it's just like no yeah like maybe when we you start don't. agreeing with him is probably when you're when you're like becoming an adult yeah maybe we don't undergo life-changing plastic surgery to um <laughs> to appease <laughs> some man we've only just met who's also two or three times our age um let's <laughs> definitely yeah I've uh, stopped googling the age of Disney princesses because um <laughs> yeah it's terrifying mm-hmm. I I've been pleasantly surprised by the newer Disney princesses so like tangled um you know age difference I mean still not one that I would be super comfortable with myself but still like far closer to what would be except 13 yes <laughs> yeah not not 13 and also not 40 um yeah. um oh that's so funny but yeah House of Earth and Blood um do they know how many books are going to be in the series for that one? I have a feeling it's gonna be four so there's four houses so I think there's um, gonna be four books but we were talking about number, this as we've discussed yeah and this book is 800 pages exactly so it's pretty long but I've heard a rumor from many of the fandom that all three of Sarah's series is this series will converge at some point so the world of throne of glass Akatar, and crescent city will somehow come together and I don't know how that's going to work if it's going to be just hinted at but so I've not read all of them but I'm really hoping that doesn't happen <laughs> Yeah, because they're all fae, right? So Bryce, the main character, yeah. is half fae. Yeah, and obviously in Throne of Glass and Akatar, they're all fae. So there's a theory that they're all going to converge somehow and bring them all together. But I don't know if that's going to be like one book or just an idea, an inkling. Yeah, that would be interesting. I think, um, I mean, if I was her and I'm not, and boy, do I wish I was, but if I was, um, I feel like you're like, 
a nice and less destructive way of managing that would be to just have like nods to it so they walk through a place and there's these people that look like that character and that sort of thing because I mean so one of my all-time favorite authors is Rick Riordan and he has this way of sort of masterfully crossing over all of his like book series with the characters but it's not like they all stand on their own in a way so that they're not obtrusive but I just from my knowledge of like Throne of Glass alone um they don't actually talk about specific fey courts and that sort of thing it's really surface level with the world building I suppose in that sort of thing because my immediate thought goes to like in the Mortal Instruments you have the two courts that are very specific in that world as well and although I don't maybe who knows you know what (laughs) <laughs> if she doesn't write it someone will on fan fiction so it's so gonna <laughs> be birthed at some point um okay so house of earth and blood by sarah j mass is your fifth and final installment um Kirsten, what is gonna is gonna be your fifth and final installment is it a, a last minute um usurper or <laughs> no it isn't i was gonna have a last minute usurper but i would say this one um this is a book Tatiana and I were talking about on uh, actually a live that we had a while back and she's like what's the book that changed your life <laughs> and um, some people may not agree I read this book when I was in high school so I was a senior in high school when I read this book um, I have not read it again since I'm sure I will have different themes that I take away from it but I would say um, it is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand so um, I I've read pretty three of her books so anthem the fountainhead and atlas shrugged and this one's my favorite of the three fountainhead um has some themes in it that are um i do not appreciate um there's some definite trigger warnings in that one so if you're gonna venture into the fountainhead uh know that but um atlas shrugged does too but i feel like this also came at a time when i was you know i was going into college and i was terrified um you know going into college and unsure of I thought I knew what I wanted to do but I wasn't completely sure and you know choosing a major and figuring things out and um you know how how do I do that do I go with you know what everyone else is asking of me do I go with what I want to do and you know there was a lot of things factors that were going into that and so reading this book was came in a perfect time as far as that again, transitioning period, transitionary period in my life. So um, there's a lot of themes that I don't agree with, I would say, even at the time that I don't agree with in the book, but there are a lot of things that I do agree with. It is a very dense read. If anyone has read it, it is, it's like a thousand pages. It's a lot, it's a lot, it's a big book. Um, And it's not one of those that you can kind of breeze through. It's one of those that you have to um, pay attention to and um, really think, Um, but it's, it's really good. I recommend it. Even if you don't agree with everything that she says in it or her themes or ideals or um, her as a person, um, I think it's definitely a, something that would be worth picking up and reading definitely for um, anyone who is interested in uh, any sort of political themes. So, which I tend to not be, but um, these had me hooked the whole time. I, um, so I'm curious because Atlas Shrugged was one that um, it kind of came on my radar and I ha- used to be on my TBR on like Goodreads and then I had an overhaul where I basically could only have things on my want to read list if I owned the books because I figured that was the only way I was actually going to read the books that I owned. So I got rid of it all and just had the books that I owned that I hadn't read on that list. So um, Atlas Shrugged ended up being removed. Um, I guess the reason why it ended up on that list was because I immediately jumped to Greek mythology type imagery because of the title. Um, is that fairly accurate or is that? No. So there, there are mentions, there are, yeah, there are mentions of Atlas in there. You know, she, um, <laughs> the uh, main character is asked a question and he's like, you know, what would what would you tell the giant Atlas to do, you know, sitting there with, you know, blood coming down his shoulders, holding the world on his shoulders. And what would you say to him to 
to uh, suppress the pain that comes from holding the weight of the world on your shoulders. She's like, I don't know. What would you tell him? And he's like, I tell him to shrug. So that's where it comes from. Atlas shrugged, wow. you know, to kind of rock the world and not literally hold the world on your shoulders and take everyone else's problems on your shoulders. When it, the only person you control, can, the only person you can control is yourself. So um, trying to control others through any sort of any sort of way, uh, whether it's financially um, in a relationship or anything like that. Um, you know, a big theme in here is, you know, I will a quote and there is, you know, I would die for you. And I think actually, I think it's in the fountainhead. He, I can't remember if it's in the fountainhead or Atlas Shrug. He says, I love you and I would die for you, but don't ever ask me to live for you because you know, I'm not going to live my life for you. I'm going to live my life for me. I love you. I would die for you. I would take a bullet for you, but I'm not going to live for you. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a big premise of a lot of, a lot of her books is, you know, living your life for yourself and yes, understanding when it needs, when it's time to step in and when it's time to help others and when, you know, it's necessary, but also you're not living your life to please others. You know, you only have one life and you got to, you know, live that life for you and do what makes you happy, whether that means being a titan of industry or creating architecture that um, people maybe don't agree with, but is fantastic. So, you know, kind of going against the grain and living your own life. I love it. I, I loved it. It was, it was a wonderful book to read, especially as in that transitionary period of being a senior going into college. Um, I thought it was, it was a great time to read that book. I would like to read it again, it is quite the commitment though. So I haven't mustered up, I haven't mustered up the time or the energy to reread it. Um, but I would love to reread it, especially now in this time in my life. It might be worth looking to see if someone famous has maybe done a audiobook. Cause I find, um, some of the big rereads, I lean towards an audiobook because I, I'm constantly doing things where I, my mind isn't occupied, but my hands are busy, so I can't read and I have to be paying attention and that sort of thing. So I'm trying to lean more towards audiobooks. Also, I kind of, it's easier for me to treat chapters like episodes of a podcast and I seem to get through episodes of a podcast far quicker than I get through chapters of books. So um, yeah, it might be cool to see if someone um, famous has done it. I find it... I, the narrator makes an audiobook for me. Yeah. I mean, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the one I cite most often probably on this podcast is because Martin Freeman voices the audiobooks and he does an amazing job. So Yeah, that's something we talked about again on our this or that episode we were talking about. <laughs> we were talking about audiobooks versus like was it Kindle or audiobooks? Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. And we were talking about it, it had the person who reads it makes it and I was like also it's kind of weird if you're like reading a romance novel and someone's talking about like smut like that's mm. kind of weird for me like personally um, yeah that but, belongs on the kindle <laughs> yeah it, but like for me it all depends on like who's reading it and who yeah. is narrating it because if you got someone who is narrating it narrating it terribly it, it will ruin the book for you and so I just yeah I don't know I, I I don't know. Maybe I'm just yeah. a purist when it comes to books, but <laughs> I, I, I love reading them and just like I need to get into audio. Book. I feel like people, it's getting much more popular, and it's such a good way to like get through your TBR mm -hmm. and all of that. I feel like I want to get. I rented a set of CDs for my library, but <laughs> I have no way to listen to them <laughs> other than to like put them in my computer. <laughs> and I'm like, I need a nice Walkman. Yeah, so I can, like, bring it to the gym and listen. <laughs> we um. I really enjoy Audible. Um, I tend to lean more towards like nonfiction books for my audio selections because I find it hard to focus on a nonfiction book um, in hand, um, but I find them easier in sort of audio form when I'm listening to like, uh, I listen to a lot of productivity and business podcasts because that is like my, my nerd thing. I really love like productivity and organizational theories. Um, I just, I just, I just, I don't know why. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think I just crave order in all areas of my life. But um, yeah, so I tend you to- You two really are the go. same person because it cracks me up. You guys are like order and business like theory podcasts. And I'm like, true crime. Yeah. I'm, like, uh, I'm a Virgo <laughs> and an Enneagram 8. And type A. <laughs> yeah. I so I have one true crime podcast on my 
sort of subscription for Spotify. And it is because it's my very good friend Ruby's um, true crime podcast and her and um, her, the two, co- uh, the, the three hosts and they make it usually true crime is not my jam but the three of them just are so funny when they're just chatting to each other that I I, I listen for them more so than the gory details um but yeah I love productivity podcasts there's a great one um which is a big inspiration for the way I structure this podcast um called beyond busy which interviews like people from like all kinds of businesses um about their views on productivity uh defining success and happiness and that sort of thing um and they're always just really fascinating guests and um the host is really good as well but yeah I go non-fiction for audiobooks because I find them easier to consume that way um also if it's like a memoir especially by comedians I am going to read No Shame by Tom uh is it Tom Allen it's Tom Allen maybe yes I think I I cannot remember now it's gone from my head but um any books that are written by comedians I listen to them because they usually narrate them themselves which makes them funnier um so yes yeah, so we have atlas shrugged as your final choice yep. um just for the benefit of the listeners in case they wanted to quickly scribble these down because they want to immediately go and buy them um do you guys both want to just quickly go through your five choices yeah sure. definitely go ahead so i had outlander by diana gabaldon blue lily lily blue by maggie stefavater the Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. The House of Blood and Earth slash Crescent City by Sarah J. Mass. And Clockwork Princess by Cassandra Clare. And I had The Hobbit by Tolkien. Born of Fire by Sherilyn Kenyon. To Sir Philip with Love by Julia Quinn. The Little Paris Bookshop by Nina George. And Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Excellent. And you had a couple, I have more than a couple of honorable mentions, I hear. Um, so what were some books that, you know, nearly made it, but um, didn't quite? So I have three, if that's okay. <laughs> as, you can have as many as you want. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have a lot, but I just, I narrowed it down to three. So mine would be The Blue Bistro by Elaine Hildebrand. This is like my favorite standalone. I think the Miserable Life of Addie LaRue might be my new favorite but this one's a standalone it's a contemporary romance about a girl who moves to Nantucket in hopes of finding a job working in the hotel industry ends up as the front desk manager of a really like high-end restaurant that is infamous in the town and at the end of the season they're closing for good and she kind of goes through this whirlwind of romance and figuring out her life and sort of figuring out the mystery of why they're trying why they're closing this you know very successful business at the end of the summer and I read this ages ago and I've reread it a million times, kind of like Kirsten. I was going through a really weird time in my life where I was living a very staycationer-esque life. I worked as a wrangler at a dude ranch in Estes Park, Colorado. And I was like, I could do this forever. I could just like run around and do exactly what this girl did and graduate college. And I did the same job in a different uh, town. And I was like, I can just never have a real job. Look at her. <laughs> so this one hit really close to home for me. And I love that book. So that was, that's my first honorable mention should I do all mine? And then you can go Kirsten. Okay. So my second one is eat, pray, love by Elizabeth Gilbert. This is also a movie. I love the screen adaptations. Can't get enough of them. (laughs) But if I was on a desert Island and couldn't leave it, I love this book so much because I had a really hard time getting all the way through it. I think in the part where she was in India and, um, sort of doing all of her meditation, things like that, that was really hard to read through, I think, because I found it a bit boring I don't know <laughs> Medita- meditation is hard when y- you're doing it so. there's like a whole chapter on it too like one third of the book is about that but if I could never travel this is a really good one because she eats a lot of pasta in Italy and then she goes to India and talks a lot about that and then she goes and ends in Bali and talks so much about like the beautiful landscaping and all the things that she can do and all that stuff so I love eat pray love <laughs> That was a lot of love. (laughs) I really like Eat, Pray, Love. I think the movie is really good, but I did enjoy the book. And that's another really good coming of age tale. And then my last and final one that I'll do is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. I love Harry Potter. (laughs) That's my favorite in the book series. Yeah, it's I think it's everybody's favorite. (laughs) Second to that would be like The Order of the Phoenix. I actually do really like that book a lot. The book is much better than the movie, but I think the Prisoner of Azkaban is such a good one. It's so pivotal in the Harry Potter series. It's a really good one. 
you don't have to have any context about what happened previously, I think, and what goes on the rest of the series. It could just end there yeah. and I'd be happy. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, my, I, it's my favorite one because it's the happiest one. Um, realistically speaking, it just is. And um, the, my favorite, absolute favorite part of it that always sticks in my mind is like the very last scene when the Dursleys are picking Harry up from platform nine and three quarters and he has a letter from Sirius in his hand and uh he asks and uh, Vernon's like what's that letter boy and he's like uh and he's just like oh it's just a letter from my long lost godfather he's escaped from prison and on the run but he says that I should let him know how you guys treat me this summer <laughs> um <laughs> and uh he just sort of just like wanders off like having delivered a killer line at age 13 and he's just really feeling himself um <laughs> And that's, that's so true <laughs> yeah yeah that's the bit that sticks with me but um so blue bistro eat pray love and harry potter and the prince of as your honorable mentions um plus you know infinite others but uh millions <laughs> but you know ty timey wimey all of that sort of stuff <laughs> one that does not exist <laughs> So, Kirsten, what are you, again, as many as you wish to share honorable mentions? I think we may know one of them. Yeah, I have three. So this one almost usurped uh, my top five, but I had to, I was like, oh, okay. Uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. I love The Count of Monte Cristo. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, I I don't know how I forgot, but I guess I did read it when I was in high school. So I read it a while ago, Um, but I absolutely loved it. I love the story. And I, um, I, I was always that kid in high school where they were like, here's the required reading and I was like one of like three people who actually read the books um (laughs) so um The Count of Monte Cristo was one of them and I I just love the story I prefer it to the movie 1000 percent um I don't like how they changed the ending not seeing the movie Um, oh they they completely ended I've not I've got no interest in watching (laughs) no they completely changed the ending like there's like it's it's weird um but anyways and so uh, but I absolutely love this book um it's uh, I just his his character arc and just the things that he goes through it's just I I absolutely loved it so um love the Count of Monte Cristo and then my second one is The Perfume Collector by Kathleen Tesaro um this one was a bit brutal I mean there's a lot of themes in here about um and trigger warning, there's some some pretty tragic, terrible things that happen um, within this. <laughs> I don't know. Apparently, I like the tragic books. Like, let's just not dive too deep into that one. But <laughs> um, but I would say uh, it's, you know, about this girl who receives this mysterious letter from some random woman she's never met or never heard of. And she's, this woman is leaving her everything, like her estate, her, all of her stocks and money, her everything. And so she's like, I don't know who this woman is. I'm not just going to take, you know, everyone else is like, just take it and go. Like she's leaving you a flat in Paris. Like she's Um, leaving you all these things, like take it and go sign the paperwork and say, all right, cool. (laughs) Like wash your hands of this. And she's like, no, I don't, I don't know this woman. I don't know how, why would she leave this to me? So it's basically this whole process in this dual timeline of your, the woman who received the estate and then the woman who gave her the estate. So you're Mm -hmm. kind of figuring this dual timeline of like who this, who these women are and how they how their lives intertwine yeah um it's it's so good it is so so good and so um I wish I could say I, I was morally upright enough to turn, turn down such a <laughs> generous inheritance but I don't know I I mean it, spoiler alert she doesn't turn it down she figures out yeah. who she is but at first she's like no everyone's like um why don't you just take it and go like it's all legal I and above she, board <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think well she was in such a like transitionary time like she found yeah. she just found out her husband was cheating on her and she just wanted to get out and like just, use like, the money to things. take revenge on your husband for cheating exactly. on you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway she's she's you know a highly one of those people that's just like no I can't but it's at, the story is very enjoyable to read uh, I agree with you I would be like oh hundreds of nice thousands of dollars you. in a flat in Paris darn don't know who you are but not questioning it like yeah. not questioning it at all and um moving to Paris now bye everything um, happens for a reason like exactly. <laughs> figure out who she is later just like <laughs> you know but sign the paperwork it's all yours and then I would say my third honorable mention is Crooked Kingdom by Lee Bardugo I oh, 
again, like you were saying, I am so, I love these characters. I love the crows so much. And I love just their arcs and who they are. And oh, I just, this one, this book destroyed me. Uh, <laughs> definitely destroyed me. Uh, I was definitely in tears at the end of this one. But yeah. um, I, I really love this one. I really think um, I, so I read obviously Shadow and Bone first and then started Six of Crows. And I think she really hit her stride when she start when she's wrote Six of Crows, but I would say Crooked Kingdom of the duology is my favorite. Tatiana, I think same. Um, but it, it, she just knocked it out of the park with this one. So, um, I absolutely love Crooked Kingdom. So, uh, those are my three honorable mentions. Oh, yeah, no, Kaz Brecker, I mean, talking about book boyfriends, Kaz Brecker is just embodies all of the most not problematic just just not great things that I know that I just should I it's like with the whole it's the gem cast as Henry from Adi LaRue I just I want to want nice golden retriever boys that just do what they tell what you tell them to and they're just lovely and you know unbothered by demons but I just apparently um <laughs> more like gray, color. In, a, <laughs> in a fiction always yeah. yeah in a fictional capacity oddly husband absolutely nothing <laughs> yeah yeah in real life red flag yeah yeah in real in life book. red flag but you know everything we want yeah <laughs> when, when you don't actually have to deal with it it's fine um and you're not in a life and death situation you can really rationalize these things I will um, say though if I'm in a life and death situation I would like I would prefer a morally gray man than oh, a golden yeah. retriever because he's gonna like there's no no question that you're gonna get out of that one alive yeah <laughs> yeah it's happened it's uh, yeah it's one of those um it's the uh touch her and i'll kill you trope uh that is i actually saw a great twitter thread on i uh, think throne of throne of glass series is in that one along with six of crows and that yeah. sort of thing it's very much that vibe um yeah count of monte cristo is i read that very recently i read it sort of both audiobook and uh thingy i originally actually bought it because um my so my a levels when I went to like sixth form over here um we were able to pick our own sort of theme for English literature studying and I knew that the Count of Monte Cristo was very famous for its revenge sort of themes and that's what I wanted to study and then it arrived and I realized how big it was and I was like hmm, I don't think I'm going to be able to read this in time and in enough detail to be able to actually use it for this so I ended up switching to a different one and then end up leaving sixth form altogether early so I never actually got to write the essay um but I had the book and I eventually I really just wanted to read it and yeah it instantly became a favorite it is epic in every sense of the word it and is just oh it is so good it is yeah. just yeah it's, it's a good one and it's made me I want to read like all of his stuff now um just Three because Musketeers and <laughs> yeah I yep. start well I've started collection like um I really want to download uh, read the Viscount of I think it's Brag Brag alone I can't I really want to learn how to speak French so that I can Same. <laughs> so that I can read <laughs> Alexander Dumas in his original language and actually really appreciate it um but yeah England uh the English education system is terrible at teaching people languages. It just is. Um, so is the American. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, you're not allowed just you. <laughs> It's just I, I've just because I've been, I've been so blessed to be able to speak to like people from all over the world through the podcast, and I'm always in awe of like people who just they're able to discuss like like they do books with me in such um, like nuanced detail. They speak better English than I do, and it's their second, third, or even fourth language, and I'm like this why why is our government set us up to fail <laughs> i think um, yep. the american school system is <laughs> arguably worse <laughs> or equally as bad it's terrible yeah i figured oh. that out when i lived abroad i was like wow you all speak better english than i do <laughs> this is not good uh yeah but um it's yeah definitely an aim of mine i want to at least read a couple of books in another language i've recently found out so i'm really into professor layton as a game and I've recently found out they released manga um, for the Professor Layton books, but none of it is in English, but I can get it in German, which I speak like I can read some of from high school. So I'm going to like get that and then I'm going to figure a way to sort of translate it so I can actually read this manga because I'm never going to be able to read it otherwise because I don't think they're ever going to publish in English. And 
I think it would be like trying a video game on like super duper difficult to try and read it in Jap- Japanese. So <laughs> Japanese is really hard to read, not even just the caricatures, but like the actual, if you read the word, yeah. it's so difficult from what it sounds like when it's pronounced versus the words on the page are insane. <laughs> yeah. My sixth form give us like a two week introductory course to, it's not the same, but to like, like more simplified, like Mandarin and I just, I mean, we, we learned some, but I just remembered that two weeks thinking I, I had no idea that the little, the, the fit characters were like words, pretty much whole <laughs> words. Um, I just, cause I mean, at least with, I mean, I suppose German and French, cause we studied like a little bit of that when we were too old for it to ever actually take root. <laughs> um, but at least I suppose there's like rules. I don't know. Anyway, sorry, complete complete random tangent but yeah the counter monte cristo excellent book another one that um you can get a free audiobook of that actually through librivox because i think it's in the public domain because of how old it is interesting interesting i, like that. I think uh, speaking of free books i think you can get if you reach out to i think you can get a free copy of any of ayn rand's books if you reach out to like their society. So like the Ayn Rand Society or the, I can't remember which it is, but um, I believe you can get a free copy of Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead or Anthem or any of her books through her society. Always good to know for listeners who want to check that out. So thank you so much for that discussion. It was really so much fun. I've had like such a blast talking to you guys. If the, if listeners wanted to listen to you guys talk about books in other places um uh, maybe get some more recommendations whereabouts can they find you so we are on instagram at the bookish banter podcast whole thing all the way out and we have a tiktok on there as well uh in our bio on instagram is the link to our web page that will have like all the places you can listen to our podcasts and then i am on bookstagram as well at the literature llama and kirsten's at kirsten keeps reading on yep. both tiktok and instagram Excellent. And yeah, I encourage listeners to go check that out. I've listened to the podcast. It is a very funny, um, entertaining podcast just about books and all the things about them that we love. So thank you very much for making that. It's awesome. And yeah, cheers up my rainy, boring report days. Um, (laughs) um, If you have enjoyed the podcast today, if you want to subscribe um, to the podcast, we, uh, to the bookish the books to last podcast sorry i'm thinking about yours now um we are in most podcast places including apple podcast spotify and uh, stitcher all the places in between and you can follow us on social media at books to last pod at twitter instagram maybe facebook maybe that might not exist anymore uh when this comes out who knows um, but mainly twitter and instagram which is where most of it goes up and uh yeah thank you listeners so much for being with us um kirsten tatiana again thank you so much for joining us and until next time uh bye for now bye bye thank you for having us yeah thank you